Yeah, just kind of, as an addition to the previous speaker, the Texas farm workers marched from, well, they're separate and different from the United Farm Workers, but they marched from Harlingen to Washington, D.C., and Jimmy Carter wouldn't even meet with them. Alice 
uh, is a, was on the second graduating class of UTSA, but she was one of the ones that had to travel so far. And she's actually a good friend of Maria. Maria's like a, a sister to me. And then, I, and then when I was in high school, I remember that battle too, uh, in terms of the, the, the member district. Um, and a lot of my uh, teachers at Central Catholic, one in particular, a, a, a retired lieutenant colonel, was very much against it and voiced it to all of us. And of course, I was hearing at home that we were in favor of it. So I voiced my, uh, my displeasure and I didn't care what my teacher thought. <laughs> <laughs> Can I give a little more? I, I, hadn't, I didn't even know there was a San Antonio in those years. Um, I grew up in southeast Michigan, right outside Ann Arbor. I grew up in the sister city, the, the other side of the tracks. I grew up in Ypsilanti, and I know there are a lot of people in the, in the room with ties to the University of Michigan. Um, and, but I grew up on the other side of the tracks. US 23 was built, um, in, in, um, in the early 60s with the intent of separating um, the clean white Ann Arbor from the factories of Ypsilanti. And when you go under US 23, you go from Ypsilanti to Ann Arbor. And, and you go from um, um, Howard Johnson's on one side, the old Howard Johnson's, on the other side, the, the big new shopping mall and the Marriott, and the high-rise Marriott. My, my, my point is, um, I remember the, um, um, integration in the, in the early and mid-60s, school integration, and what those freeways did to separate our, our, our com working class communities from um, the intelligentsia in, in Ann Arbor. And Eastern Michigan beginning to grow as a teacher school um, for the kids who couldn't quite work quite good enough to go to the University of Michigan. And, and, and on and on. So I, I guess even though I didn't know um, the first time I met someone um, with, with um, a Latino surname was when I was in college. But, but the African American communities is where I grew up. I went to high school that was about 65% African American. So, and, and I remember 1968 and the Detroit riots very well. And, and the cleansing of the urban light um, because Ypsilanti was an old town factory town, and, and the same things were going on, my point is, the same things were going on in my world. That's what I grew up with. That's what I saw. And so, it wasn't just here, it was, a, it was an international thing. So I think we have to keep a world perspective in mind when we talk about what was going on in, in, um, in San Antonio. Do you remember the slang name for Salanti? It was a that was white against white because the force from the, you know, the, uh, what was it? Ipsy Township. Yeah. I actually grew up in Ipsy Township. Yeah. They had come up and that's how they separated. Ipsy Tucky. Ipsy Tucky and Ipsy Tennessee is what a lot of people call it because it was a mixture of, of poor working class. Right. Working in the fact that you couldn't After the school. depression or something, they might play with you. Okay, right. we're gonna move on. Yeah. Okay. Thank, yeah. Thank you for that. For that. Um, wow. No. Thank, thank you for the uh, larger perspective. Um, so again, still seventies West Side urban removal. Then we put 1979 the Avenida Guadalupe to engage in economic development um, in the West Side. So that's when they're trying to. That's what I think Maria put that right. I put the West, that was in the 70s is when my neighborhood was erased, the Guadalupe South, and it's the, what we're calling the historic West Side. So thousands of, you know, everybody left the neighborhood, got pushed out over to homes out there, and, and some of us were able to stay, but, um, but every, you know, the whole history and culture and traditions from that community, like in Hemisphere, like so many other communities, gets destroyed. Late 60s, early 70s. So then you're entering the 80s. 
and a big victory was that it was a coalition of inner city uh, neighborhood associations, not just the ones that were there. All the neighborhood associations at the time saw that it meant something for them, so they all got together. And we kept the high intense development, like Valero and so on, from coming to the other side of the expressway, because that's what they wanted. They wanted to build two tall towers. Where Sons is? Excuse me? No, across the street where Our Lady of Sorrows is. Okay. Across the highway, sorry. Yes. Uh, that was the same uh, where Valero is today, or what, what is it now? Saws? Sorry. Uh, there was a neighborhood, and it was the oldest, uh, it was a uh, neighborhood, and because Trinity was built to quarry, and so that was a neighborhood, Los Pastores. That was one of the uh, part there. Right. And it was, it is, it's one of the saddest things that happened as far as I'm concerned. It was and uh, they took, what happened was the developers, uh, same developers, tried to uh, have people relocated. And what happened was is that they, they were relocated to places like on the other side, down walls and road, crazy places that went, they wound up losing. But that was when a developer actually said, OK, we're going to, uh, because of the pressure of the same uh, groups, decided to just, just to relocate people. Littleton decision? Yeah, that's Christy Lee Littleton. He's the first major national trans decision. Um, Hardberger um, decided and wrote the decision in this district. It said that um, um, the, the gender you're born with is the only gender you can ever have. And that started a national trans movement. But, and um, it is. Um, for many years, it was other national decisions were founded on that decision. Um, and it wasn't overturned in Texas. And then other districts, like Houston, um, um, came up with the same, depending on Littleton, with the same decision. And so you could get, different people could get marriage licenses in San Antonio and in Austin. Um, depending on your name and gender marker changes. And so it, it, it affected the, the LGBT community a lot in South Texas. And it wasn't overturned until after the um, a marriage decision, June 26th of last year. Just a, a little bit on, on, I don't know the exact facts of this case, but this case involved uh, Christy Lee Middleton John, who was a transgender woman who had married a, a man, and then he, there, it was a wrongful death suit, and she had won the suit. I, th I forget how much money. And it went, uh, they appealed it, um, and when it went up on appeal, the, that's when the, who was it, uh, the former mayor? Harburger. Harburger wrote the opinion that said, no, the, the, the marriage was invalid because Christy Lee Littleton was not a woman. And because the definition, of, at least in this opinion, of woman was uh, was chromosomes, and and, had, and basically completely, you know, botched up the issue about uh, what what it means to be uh, transgender. And she was she was a Latina woman um, who, who married an Anglo man, but then she wound up marrying um, a relative of Leticia Vanderpeet, and they were related. And so it affected Texas politics again because the, our greatest supporter in the world, in my opinion, is Leticia. Cool. So then also we have, I wanted to put these two together, um, Applewhite vote and the Alpha Down vote. So I'll just real quickly that uh, in uh, um, July of 1989, the city council voted to uh, create um, Applewhite which would have been a reservoir on the south side of the, of the city that would provide 40 million acre feet to supplement the aquifer up in the north side in case when it dried up. And that's what the city council passed. But fortunately, in 19, the community got signatures over several years. And in 1994, um, no, in 1991, it was defeated. Uh, the, the people defeated it. 
and even though we had spent $60 million, they had to abandon it. And then it came back. Nelson Wolf brought it again in 1994. That was Apple Y2. And our community uh, defeated it again. Tell why they wanted Apple Y. They wanted Apple Y because at that time, in, 1980, in the 1980s, you still had a lot of vacant land in the north side that is the land over the aquifer. And there were community people that I call the water people who saw that if you built um, and you brought gas stations and impervious cover uh, to that area, eventually we would pollute our only source of water. So the developers were real smart and they said, why don't we uh, build this reservoir? It's really not gonna take care of the problem, but it will look like we're uh, solving the problem. And also, there was um, a Clean Water Act amendment that Henry B. Gonzalez had passed that said, if you build over there, you're not going to get certain federal assistance because it's the sole source of water. You just have one source. But if you build this puddle down there, then you have another one, so you would nullify the, the amendment. And that's why they wanted it. It was a sneaky way to build more. Uh, and even though Apple Y wasn't built, the powers that be in the city are so powerful that if you get a certain lobbyists like Bill Kaufman or Brown involved, they pass all the Sony cases. For 10 years on the city council between 81 and 91, I voted against every single Sony case, but every week they passed and passed and passed because there were never six votes who would go against the developers. And still today, they're not six votes that would go against Isn't that what the pipeline is for now? The, and the, the, pipe, the Vista Ridge pipeline is the same thing. Now, we're getting the water from over there because we know that eventually, we might not have this one. And people want to go get somebody else's water. And also because the people that run this city want to keep on having their, their golf courses and their grassy lawns and pretending that we're not an Arab community. So they don't want us, they don't want to have to live by the uh, limitations of drought. You know, water so if we have all this water coming, then they can go on living like they have up to now. So we also have the, the Aganda, Alexander Patch Courts, and City Development organized so repairs up and where to force the housing authority to do their work. I, didn't, I don't know who wrote that. I, I wrote that. It's a very interesting first experience for me in that country. I was on course because uh, um, my department, a number of us, uh, volunteered to help clean up the apartments and get them ready. Basically, there were over 500 families that were on the waiting list for the apartments, and the housing authority was not releasing. They were very, very slow in releasing apartments so that only about two-thirds of the apartments were actually occupied at any one time. So we had all of these people like floods from um, the public schools and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, so, and um, a lot of young people volunteered that day and we worked really hard. But they made a point of having each of the crew leaders be people who would live in the Alcatraz on course and had subsequently been able to move to uh, their own homes in the neighborhood. So they were really inspiring to work with them and hear about how Apache Alabama courts had actually been a step up for them. Uh, students have 1991, Gulf War. Uh, 1994, Sanida comes to being after their pushed out of their jobs and Levi's jobs moves to Costa Rica. It's also the same time frame where Clinton comes to San Antonio to sign NAFTA, the NAFTA North American Free Trade Agreement. The Cops Metro presses SAWS to charge full impact fees to developers. Do you want to say a little bit more? Uh, yeah, but, uh, basically for the entire time that uh, the city has been developing infrastructure for having water mains and, and sewers and so forth to new uh, neighborhoods. Uh, the, basically, the developers were getting their expenses paid for out of the uh, costs that were borne by the existing residents. And so, it, and for many, many years, 
uh, Cox Metro was trying really hard to try to force them to uh, make the developers pay for the part that that uh, should go become part of the price of the houses or the buildings that were being built. And so they finally pressed SOS to uh, charge the impact fees. And the very next year, the state legislature, at the request, uh, the request of the uh, developers, put a cap on it such that now uh, it's only when the state legislature raises the cap that the, any of that uh, is um, lifted from. So all of the existing residents have been subsidizing the infrastructure to build all of the new homes, everything outside of the uh, inner loop uh, for all of these years. And basically, they're, they're forced to. So I just want to uh, tell a little bit more about the aquifer because this is a moment. Uh, in 1992 and 93, there was a huge effort by the community spurred by uh, the Applewhite to put a moratorium on development over the aquifer. And so the city, in response, appointed a special committee, including Jean Dawson. In order to allow Jean Dawson to be on that committee, they had to enact a special resolution waiving him from the conflict of interest provisions of the state government. That um, committee came out with a draft moratorium, which was passed by city council, it, to a overflowing crowd of cheering community, finally we're going to be able to save the aquifer, and so the moratorium was passed. In December of the same year, the city attorney, together with Jean Dawson and other members of the committee, announced to the press, oh my goodness, there was a mistake in the moratorium, and it's not effective. And so we're going to work to get, to get an effective one. So then for the next uh, five or six weeks, Jean Dawson platted, filed um, property uh, claims or property plans over virtually all of the aquifer land. Um, after that, they enacted another moratorium, but by that time, because Dawson and, and others had filed these plats, they were, quote, grandfathered, so they were not subject to the moratorium. That was PGA. Yeah. Well, we discovered that in PGA, but the fact is that Gene Dawson manipulated it so that we got all of the developments. Wow. Uh, yeah, can I add just a little bit on Senate Bill 66 that Meredith brought up? What, what the, the developers did when they went to the legislature and capped the impact fees, they also made sure that Texas could not do what other states do. In other states, developers actually pay for other things like drainage. Um, it is, uh, there are a lot of things they can pay for with impact fees. Impact, and what it is, is the impact your development has on the public. Right? And it was a whole bunch of things. So they made sure that the only thing that they can pay, that they pay for is water. They eliminated drainage. They eliminated everything else. And who pays for the rest of the stuff? We do. For us. Okay, quickly again, out of the movies, 1992, first lesbian film festival at the Guadalupe, San Antonio Lesbian Gay Assembly, all in the early 90s. Um, the city of San Antonio offers up Assembly Gardens for lease. That's me. And River Road. <coughs> Park we had, we shed it on it. And, and uh, it became so uh, detailed that uh, all of the uh, potential developers left. And then the Parks Foundation uh, came in. And it was Patty Radel was on the council at the time. And it was agreed upon at the council level that there would never be a charge to enter the sunken gardens. Um, coalition forces no change for not uh, the garage. Okay. Right, the Woody Garage is the for, well. It's not the Woody Garage. That's a hard part that, because there's so many signs that say Woody Parking. But the part, the garage on Avenue B between Toledo and Kitty Park or, or uh, Mulberry is basically a city garage 
that is does not is never supposed to charge. And it was the first of the garages, now there's a lot of them being proposed in Brackenridge Park. And the idea at the time is the same idea that it is now, that people would park there and take their things into the park. But there, were ne there was never any talk of people movers or anything like that. But that was the first garage that was built. Uh, now there's subsequent proposals, but that, that was it. 1997, Esperanza gets defunded. Uh, again, targeting our LGBT work, but we know that it's because more hosting gatherings like this and challenging the developers. Uh, somebody wrote, Battle in Seattle opens up dialogue about neoliberalism, neoliberal capitalism. 1997, United Students Against Sweatshops is founded. The Zapatista Rise Up, actually, 1994. Um, La Gloria falls in 2002, PGA struggle starts around 2001 and goes on for five or six years. Um, 2001, Esperanza wins the lawsuit against the city at the federal court. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, 2005, uh, Eastside residents save Pay Street Bridge, and then there's like an arrow that goes all the way to Is that the one about the line there? No, about the Eastside Residency Pay Street. Okay. Press really fast. Um, and Texas Legislature charges the law to. That one is a, it's the New London decision where the Supreme Court of the five to four vote said that a city could take a neighborhood and hand it over to developers. Yeah. And then the state legislature in Texas said, no, you can't do that in Texas. And I'm wondering, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm wondering why we haven't ever used that law to protect the, exactly that kind of taking. Well, that's
but it's it's just like that's too much of our history of San Antonio. Hey, can I say something? I think it's a terrible looking building. And besides the manufacturing that was done, it was never used for anything else. The, the top part, it was a BMW. And after that, it's been empty. All the windows are broken. The bottom looks terrible. Uh, there's really not much history to that building. It's just sitting there uh, looking very ugly. Very, very ugly. And they, they could have built a new building there. We need some new buildings in the neighborhood, you know. Uh, because some of the old ones, uh, they, 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 they really, there's nothing to them. There's no real history about it. Uh, uh, I used to go to the dances there a lot when they were in the But, uh, you know, that's how we brought it has. We need to tear down that building. Uh, thank you. Not uh, all buildings we're trying to cite were pretty. You know, it's there. They, they look in terrible shape, the cost of luxury repair, we're trying to find people interested. But there is a lot of history to that building. Uh, just uh, it's ugly looking, but unfortunately, appearances don't always, that marks are not always beautiful. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, sorry, she's asking me a question. Sorry. It's okay. What was that? I heard a commotion about... No, no, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> she's asking me about um, times of... If you could just... Do you want to ask? Make someone else. Oh, because I was late. But I was asking about... Because um, I work a lot on the east side. And there was a big change like when the east side terrace housing projects were, were torn down. And, and then a lot of people at that time got displaced to, to the north east side. And also set in homes, but I don't remember the exact date of that. Is any, I guess, that was in the 90s. That was in the 90s. And Eastside Terrace. No, actually the 90s. Okay. Because Eastside Terrace was, was huge. You had a huge displacement of people from the east side to the north east side. Cool. So, now we're moving into the... Uh, yes. These two acronyms, uh, C R A S. And oh, I agree. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I have given information from Maria. I don't know the exact detail because, in my opinion, it was done very quietly. And some people that are usually away paying attention were totally unfamiliar with it. And it's a type of infill housing, and they can do it anywhere now. And they like to come in in the lower income neighborhoods because people are less organized. Uh, they have to go to work every day. They can't go downtown and fight city hall. Right. And what's going on is they try to tear down houses and build up to eight houses in a spot. If you want to see a prime example, they didn't tear anything down. But that's what our future looks like right across from Hay Street Bridge. They call it North Cherry Street Modern. And if you know anything about construction, they have tin, metal tin roof that in the past be used for chicken coops yep. on their porches and whatever. Mm -hmm. And they, these people came from somewhere else, still paid over $200,000 mm -hmm. for these boxes. And that's what they want to bless us with in the inner city, wherever they can squeeze it in. And they will hound you with that wonderful group from Houston, and help with your local realtor. And if you resist, I have personal experience, then they will send you code compliance and make your life miserable. Oh, yeah. And that's nothing new, but they're also doing it in downtown areas wherever it's popular. Right now it's Southtown. Somebody referred to this disco district. And they're bringing in bars and restaurants, which is fine. But they should provide parking. And they should stay out of people's front yards. Everywhere else, if you want to build a bar or a restaurant or whatever, you have city ordinances. 
Well, in the lower, less developed area, they throw the baby out with the water. And we have, we're looking at big problems. You guys better stop, pay attention, and fight. There was a case that was won by a north side. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. But, um, we have, it's actually 12. Yeah. So I want, I want us to maybe uh, finish this maybe 15 minutes so that we have like one more thing that we, we want to kind of look at a power map if y'all, if y'all interested in that. Like who's making all of these decisions? Can we go um, forward to the part that got me here? Like what are we going to do? Yeah, yeah, so we're, we're actually there now. We're in 2010. Why did I come? So we, well, the reason why we wanted to do this timeline was because it's like, so I, I just want to say my age, I'm going to out myself. I'm 20. Three years old. Good. I know, right? Um, I'm years old, and I have too many friends who are activists who are my age who say, we need a new movement, we need to do this, this is new, this is new, this is new, and I'm like, guys. <laughs> and because I, you know, because I spend so much time, you know, with my grandmother and with, with, with other people that, who know this history, I have a better sense of, okay, this is not new. But there's too many people who say this is new. So that's why, that's why we're doing this. But yeah, 2010, um, decade of downtown, 2010 to 2020. And decade of downtown um, really is this idea of uh, like this, this revamping of downtown. And so that's where you have all these lofts that we're seeing that are downtown. That's where you start seeing downtown expanding into the west side, east side, south side. Um, and that's kind of what's happening now. Um, you have the Hay Street Bridge lawsuit, which is 2000, started 2013 to now. This is this is another um, battle where um, private, public spaces being coming privatized. Um, someone can speak to that later if they wanted to. There's some folks that were part of that battle here. Um, the Hemisphere Hotel fight started in 20, 2012, four years ago. Um, Elmendorf. Okay, so I'm from Lake <coughs> Lake University area. Um, my park is Elmendorf Park. Four years ago, there was um, they wanted to revamp that area, and I remember the rhetoric of the president who was there at the time, of the president of the university, saying that we need to make this area better because people who are coming to school here don't like think it's ghetto and they don't want to live. They don't want to go to school there. And I said, I live in that area, and I go to, I went to school there. I said, well, then I don't want like racist in my school. But um, that was the conversation that they were having. That's why they wanted to revamp the park. And they had said the community came out and said, we just just give us our pool, keep our pool. They got rid of the pool, and now we don't have it. And they said, well, maybe five years from now you'll have a pool. So yeah. yes, me too. Um, so then we have Domésticas Unidas created in 2012. We have the, the destruction of Univision 2013. This um, Esperanza and other community folks, and other community organizations came together to save the Univision building because it's a historic site. Um, but it, you, as you know, like that was not that was lost. And if you go downtown, it's right across from Hemisphere. Those are the Agave apartments now. And I looked up the cheapest apartments start at like. 1,500 for a studio, and then go down to 3,000, dollars for a loft. Um, and they're supposed to be for people like me who are young millennials. I could not afford that. I would not live there. <laughs> it's for the Austin millennials that can afford it, not for the San Antonio millennials. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. They can't afford Austin too, anymore. Too many. I'm college debt. Yes. Um, Family worker house. Okay, sorry, I'm bringing people back. Um, we have Haven for Hope Campus started 2012. You have uh, Mission Trails was a big fight 2014, 2015. We need to talk about yeah. Haven. Yes, one, yes. One quick statement about about that. One of the populations we haven't mentioned at all. We've talked about the neighborhood, etc. What about the displacement of homeless? A great example is the Survivors Lofts. When they built the Survivors Lofts, which was a big project of the county, and they cleaned it up and they got rid of the homeless youth who had been there. So do you think a couple months later, when they busted multiple trafficking trap houses two blocks from there, that it was an accident? 
Absolutely not. The only ones who really profited from the building of the Salias Lofts are the developers and the traffickers, human trafficking, because there was no, they weren't displacing any communities, but in reality they were. How many beds do you think there are, emergency beds, in this city um, for the LGBT community um, under the age of 18? Zero. Zero. Um, 41% of the homeless population, youth population, in this city is LGBT. 10% of the general national population is a high end estimate. My point is, when we're displacing homeless youth especially, we have to have forethought in where those people are going to go. Just like we're talking about communities and displacement of communities and people who own homes and things like that, um, in many cases they stand a better chance than those homeless individuals, especially the homeless youth. I'll put myself up, sorry. Thank you, okay. So I, I know a lot, I'm just gonna like mention these because I know a lot of us know about these just so that we can move on to the tower map and then we can like discuss it when we have time. If we have time, we can stay here longer and talk about them more. Um, and also just wanted to throw it out here, we do wanna continue these discussions and have more meetings, uh, another meeting next month so that we can really delve into what's happening currently um, now that we have this historical like, view um, and so that we can actually start strategize further. Um, so we have the, okay, so I said mission trails, then I said this fight, uh, Bracken Ridge, kind of the master plan started last year being developed, um, community members were not invited, and then that's when you have this summer when um, Maria and and other folks realized we were invited, asked for community meetings, and that's what happened recently. Um, oh, and then I, then I put 2017 Texas Water Grids. This is more looking for what's happening now into the future that we're kind of focusing. We talked about Vista Ridge Pipeline, how it's bringing water that into San Antonio, but the water grid is gonna be all over Texas, bringing water from Oklahoma and Louisiana all the way to the major cities in Texas, and so that's gonna um, really bump up uh, or the cities and really um, have it in all like the major cities in Texas, where they're just gonna be like very, um, you know, all of the lofts, all of it, yes, very congested. So that's that's what's happening. Um, so yay, we got to do this. Yay. Maybe not the most important part, but one of the parts we wanted to get through was who is making these decisions? Who has the power in the city of San Antonio? The city manager. Well, let's let's look at. We have a map. So they're gonna they're gonna make it bigger so we can see it. You have the tech, which is a, 
a new kind of subsection of the developers, um, like Rackspace, Geekdom, TechBlock, and actually they, they put into all three, but um, Mr. Weston, who, who's the founder of Rackspace, also found Geekdom and TechBlock, and he's really, he's behind the Uber, he's behind really kind of um, bringing Google uh, Fiber into San Antonio, and why that might be good is also bringing a certain, um, um, they're saying like they want these people to go into the law. So keep, like when you think of millennials, the people that work at, at tech block and have tech jobs and have lots of money to spend three thousand dollars on law. Um, yes. What does the color represent? Do you? Alan, do you want to explain the colors? It's neighborhood associations, 
it's um, uh, demolitions, it's um, all, all the issues that we mentioned. So all of us are limited in time, so each of us concentrates on our issue. And so to me, the biggest thing that I have seen in many years that stands in the way of community addressing the problems is that they are so diverse and that we're split and it's divide and conquer. Right. And unless there's, unless we as a community find a way to work across all kinds of communities, uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna do it because they're going to uh, divide us against each other. And, uh, and it's not you know. And I don't blame anybody for that because you you fend for your own. Uh, so uh, for example, the official neighborhood association system that I credit myself for helping back in the early 80s need to understand that the issue of gentrification affects everybody and it affects them too. You know, it's not, as long as we say that group, it's being done to that group, it doesn't affect me. Uh, it's not good. You know, if water rates affect the poor, they're, they're affecting us too. So uh, to me, those are just thoughts to have um, on uh, on this, and the final one is one that's very personal to me, because I was asked by Julian Castro to serve on the mayor's task force on preserving dynamic and diverse neighborhoods, and I did uh, against my better judgment, and it was fixed, it was a farce, and uh, uh, under the new leadership, and so we need to be also careful how we are used, uh, and and for me. I like it better to be outside the system uh, and holding it accountable and being together and strong uh, because this is what we have to um, address. And Graciela asked me to address the issue of who controls. And I wish all of you would read my book because I explained it there. It's no big secret. But I call it the 17 white men who run the city because it doesn't matter who, who, what the name of the person is. It matters that it's the people who have the power because they have businesses that can hire thousands of people on their own. It's the construction companies that are going to build. It's the engineering companies like Kate Dawson because that's very important. It's the banks. It's the media. Uh, and, and they sit together. They sit together. And they're the ones that decide on these big issues. So until we know that, uh, that that's what, what the... Um, the, the costs or the, the ones that are creating the changes, and it's two words, okay, that we have had in San Antonio since the 1950s.